So let's go back to the year 1976. It was the first day of water skiing in Canyon Lake, Arizona. I was out with my girlfriend and my roommate. I had just gotten up on a slalom ski and taken a big cut to the left, and my roommate's boat, which was an inboard, caught on fire, smoke building on amongst their feet. My girlfriend was supposed to have raised the orange flag. Of course, she couldn't because of the terror of the fire and the smoke. Another boat came around the corner, just like that, steered clear of them, and the rest is history, which is pretty destined if you look at it. The lake there was probably 200 yards wide, my ankle two inches. The next morning, I woke up out of anesthetics, and I did the proverbial I don't want to look, but let's see, and there it was, a missing spot next to my right foot where my left foot should have been. Just a few moments later, my hospital room door opens just a tiny bit, and there's my dad who had flown in from Chicago, and he pokes his head in, and there's a half-hearted look of hope on my dad's face, which quickly turns to sadness, and then just as quickly goes to pity. A second later, the door closed, and he was gone. I didn't see my dad again for several months. So in the next few moments, I laid there, pitiful, feeling that my body had been eternally damaged, that I was never going to be whole again. The very next morning, they wheeled me down in a wheelchair down to the basement where uh, physical rehab took place. And they parked me right in a row of four to five other patients in their wheelchairs. And I was probably youngest there by a factor of three or four. I sat there, unable to walk, unable to move, looking down at my pink foot attached to aluminum tube attached to my plaster of Paris bandage. I was discharged within the week, and they gave me strict instructions. Go out and, and walk two to three times a day with your new friends, your crutches, and toughen up that stump. Well, I followed directions, and on the way back, I tripped on a pebble the size of a pea. And I thought to myself, I'm never going to be able to walk again. But I did learn how to walk. In a couple of months, I was up and walking. And I was at my girlfriend's parents' house for the weekend. And just before dinner, my girlfriend's father takes me out into the carport and he puts his hand on my shoulder. And, and with a very compassionate but directive plea, he asked me, he said, Van, you're going to have to learn to accept this. So I bit my tongue. Okay, on one hand, I knew that he was right. Okay, it would take years, literally years, for me to accept that I am now an amputee. But I would not accept the fact that I had to wear this foot. It just didn't make sense. See, seven years prior, they had landed Man on the Moon. And Buzz Aldrin not only walked, but he ran on the moon. Do you remember those days? I did. And I sat there thinking, why is it they have all this technology and I'm wearing a SATCH foot? SATCH is an acronym which means single axis cushioned heel. Well, there's a little cushion heel, it gives you a little bit of cushy. There's a heavy wooden block and there's a piece of rubber that just goes out to the toe. I'm going to try to help you understand what it's like to be an amputee who was an athlete all through high school and college. Now have to wear this. Some of you, at least out in the audience, have snow skied. And remember what it feels like at the end of the day to kick off those ski boots and put on your hiking boots? Remember how light and alive your feet feel again? Well, the satch foot is akin to the ski boot. The foot does nothing for you. It's basically inanimate, it's dead, it's heavy, and yet it's the standard of the world. You basically have to pick it up and put it down. If you forget, it's lagging behind you with every step. Also, as an amputee, you no longer have the ability to plantar flex or point your foot down to the ground. You step off a curb you didn't see. Remember landing flat foot and that shudder goes up your spine? That's what it feels like to an amputee with every step, especially trying to run. I pole vaulted in high school, but you don't have to be a pole vaulter to know just what that pole's doing. It's absorbing tremendous amounts of energy, ready to spring that vaulter over the rod. Most of us probably have dived off a platform diving board. We know how far we can get off there. But the springboard, it's a whole different ball game. After I was, quote, rehabilitated, I started doing things that I liked, hiking. There probably wasn't a hiking trail that I've ever been on where I wasn't designing the next foot or 
or solving how the ankle could store and release in the midst of trying to avoid all the rocks that would trip me. In the early days, I was obsessive. <laughs> uh, I was just dead certain that I was going to sit down at this table and for the next five, six hours, and for the day after that, I was going to design a leg. And I probably went through hundreds of designs, scribbling, tearing up, ripping. And as the years went by, I realized that there was some sort of balance to this process called creativity or invention. I liken it to a surfer. He paddles out into the water. He's ready to go. And what does he have to do? He has to wait. He has to use all of his senses, keen, the wind, the water, feeling the swells. And when he gets that swell that comes in, he rides it. There's a balance there. In the concept of inventing, you look at a blank piece of paper. It's almost like you're looking through a veil or a black curtain. You're trying to peek through to the other side, and yet you have this strong intention, which on my part was necessity. So if there was a title slide to this talk, it would have said, necessity is the mother of invention. And in my necessity, my needs, the things I wanted, I wanted to become whole again. I wanted a foot that I could run again. Remember, this was 1976. Prosthetics had been in a time warp practically since First or Second World War. And why? Because there were no large companies big enough that wanted to invest any dollars in such a small market share called amputees, as opposed to the numbers that are heart patients, cancer patients, diabetics, hip replacement patients. That's where the money was, and still is today. There still are no large companies investing market share dollars, creating new feats. So it was really the last of the frontiers of medical science that someone like myself, who wasn't an engineer, could come in and make a difference. My first foot that I created was basically a carbon graphite foot plate. I attached it here in the middle. There was a little rubber pad in the back and the, in the front. I was playing tennis, indoor tennis, in the winter of 1982 at the University of Utah. And I would break one of these feet a week. And for the following week that it took me to make another one, I was depressed, literally physically depressed because I had to go back to my satch foot. Then I met my, part, my, my to-be partner, Dale Ellisgolf, a world-renowned graphite engineer. We met one night, and then three weeks later to the day, we had designed fabricated, laid up on a tool, cut out, and adhered a J-shaped carbon graphite leg to a socket. And that night, I ran down his condominium hallway on carpet, and I sprinted. That experience, running, sprinting, free again, I was a true believer. There was nobody in the world that was going to tell me that what I was doing was wrong. I can't think of two or three things in my life that were that for certain. It gave me the courage to go on. As the years went by, I learned that there were techniques for stimulating creativity. My dad had brought back a sword during World War II from China, and he hid it in the attic. He didn't know, but I would go up there and always try to unsheath it. It was wicked. It had this huge, great big curved C-shaped blade to it. That image has always stayed in my head. CAD, or computer-aided design, years back, it was the exception rather than the rule. Take a part like this part, and I could spin it in my head. I could see it from different angles. Plus, being an amputee, I was able to take each iteration of every design. I could sense, oh, did that change? What would that feel like? Then you look at the cheetah, and you go, how in the world does this animal have the speed to actually pass you on the left-hand side on the Kennedy? It's got muscular genetics. But it's what the muscles are attached to that gives the animal the speed that it has. It's attached to tendons and ligaments, and those ligaments are attached to the joints and the bones. Researchers have taken tendons from cadaver animals, and they put them in very sophisticated machines that stretch those tendons. And the amount of energy that an animal or a human tendon can store and release is almost beyond imagination, at least in terms of what man has made. So on the human, what we see is the gas rocks right here, indicated by number four. But look at the size and the massive length of that Achilles tendon and ligament that goes down to attach on the heel. That's like a huge rubber band right there. Carbon graphite is the only thing that can compete with human and animal tendons. Right here, you can see a single strand of carbon graphite laying on top of a human hair. That's how small the strands are. But when the carbon graphite are bunched together with thousands of strands, and they're held together with a carbon epoxy matrix, which is basically a glue, now we have something that surpasses the energy storing capability of natural tendons. Amy Mullins, 
I first met Amy at a Paralympic track meet on the East Coast. Amy was running around the 400 meter track and a prosthetist, Wayne Wilkerson from Southern California and I, God, you couldn't help but notice her. She had such spirit. She was basically carrying around heavy satch foot feet that were strapped onto her legs. She was wearing wool socks. She'd take her legs off, blisters all over the place. Wayne Wilkerson invited her to come to San Diego. Let me build you a couple suction socket silicone legs. I step up, let me give you a couple cheetah feet. Amy was one of the first amputees to learn how to run without heels. Pretty much everybody else in the arena was afraid that they were gonna hyperextend their knee and blow out their, blow out their knee joint. Even on pretty unrocky or uneven terrain, you learn where to place your toe. It's kinda like riding a bicycle. You learn it and you got it. It's really not that difficult. Running on the beach, it's one of my favorite things I know how to do. That is freedom. I said yes to L'Oreal because we can do some really incredible things. The complexity of, of who we are as people that make us beautiful. I love the way that you often describe yourself as a bionic woman. <laughs> yeah, I don't actually describe myself that way. Other people describe me as that, but as we see, I am definitely not bionic. I'm just as human as everybody else. I've heard Amy in a subsequent interview say that Pamela Anderson has more bionics in her body than Amy, <laughs> than Amy ever had, but nobody seems to mind or call her a bionic lady. Let's upshift to Oscar Pistorius. Oscar was denied the ability to run in the last Olympics. He actually appealed that and won, but failed to make the qualifying time for the South African team. In the upcoming Olympics, Oscar has cut a second and a half off his time and is expected to make the qualifying team and time. You can see him running here with an able body. And here, standing in front of the starting blocks, you can see the massive length of the carbon graphite. There's two runners in the world who actually have a few comments about Oscar being able to run. Uh, Michael Johnson, the current world record holder, four-time gold medal winner um, in the in 400, and Ewan Thomas, the UK 400 record holder. Now, should CAS have ever made that particular ruling? I disagree with that. Could possibly have an advantage over able-bodied runners who don't have the aid of a prosthetic. His prosthetic could be made such that he's never going to get chin splits. He's run very well this year. The danger really is now, a year ago when he was running 46.3, 46.4, nobody really cared. Now he's running 45.0 and potentially can run faster, as Michael said. Now people are really beginning to question that. Now people are beginning really to question that. And I have questioned that for quite a long time. Years ago when I was on the lecture circuit, Carl Lewis was the world record 100 meter or 400 meter sprinter. And I used to say in my lectures back then, if Carl Lewis, God forbid, had a car accident and he lost both of his feet, I could help him run faster than he ever has before. And the reason is kind of simple, if you, pay, if you kind of follow along here. Everybody just, if you will, if you want, take your foot and plantar flex up your toe all the way down and bring it all the way back up as far as you can, just like you would do in running. Now do that five times as fast as you can. Your foot's really not that fast, is it? I mean, it's kind of dumb. <laughs> okay, so. This is a foot similar that he's running on. Let's pretend I have three of the Chicago Bears linemen, approximately 750, 20 pounds. Three Chicago Bears linemen pulling back on this foot. Now if I had this rigged and I put a bowling ball here, I could hurl that bowling ball way over the heads of the back row, no problem. It's that quick. You can kind of see how fast it comes. Probably 100 times faster than a human foot can release its energy. So yes, I think someday the fastest, not maybe 100 meter runner, but 200, 400 meter will be a bilateral amputee. So let's say you're not an Oscar Pistorius, and let's say you're not one of these American war vets coming back from Iraq, or let's say you're not a John Holmes, another American vet who has gone on to compete in New York Marathon. Or let's say you're not a Tom Whitaker, who in his third attempt in that many years finally made it to the top of Mount Everest with the help of a custom energy storage flex foot with ice crampons in the bottom. Or let's say you're not one of these fortunate Western world children running around and sporting on their sea sprint. Or for those of you who have kids, let's say your name isn't Hiccup and you haven't fashioned your own foot. Or let's say your name's not Ellie Mae Chalice running with Oscar in this picture here. Let's say you're one of the five to 15 million amputees, people, 
in developing world countries who have stepped on landmines or other war-related injuries. Maybe you're this boy or this one. Landmines is a huge problem. In 2001, 70 countries around the world reported landmine and landmine casualties. Someone might ask the question, why hasn't Western world prosthetic technology gone into those developing countries? Well, the answer might be akin for the same reason that the heads of major pharmaceuticals haven't discounted their products, their drugs, and shipped them to third world countries for the fear that they could come back to that country of origin through the back door, maybe through some black market, and discount the enjoyed profit margins that they're experiencing. I happen to know that firsthand. My partner at Flexfoot ran two major pharmaceuticals in Southern California. Here's a typical, quote, high-tech shop in Cambodia. Once again, satched foot, a patient destined for a life of handicap. When I lost my leg, and it's still current today, you have your fitting, you have your, your training, and then you are, deemed, you are deemed fit and ready to go into the world. But that fitness is determined because you've walked either through parallel bars here or across maybe 30 feet of very smooth tile flooring. But what if you want to do more than that? What if you have a family? I have a daughter. I love running with her on the beach. That group of professionals never said you were ready for this. Or well, let's say you live in a world where rural farming is the norm. Or you live in the mountains where there's intense sunlight, heat, rocky terrain, sand, dust. There's a basic equation of what a basic prosthetic foot needs. It needs shock absorption on every single step. Shock is a function of force. That's the amount of g-force that I land with and how much time I can disperse that force over. The equation necessitates that you have at least one inch of vertical bounce. And when I sold Flexwood in 2000, the two feet that I was most proud of was this side sing leaf spring, piece of carbon graph that would bend like a leaf spring, and this air shock here with a hollow tubular urethane thing that would allow rotation. Not unlike a fox shock on a bicycle. It's year 2000, and I'm thinking, what am I gonna do for third world countries? How can I make something that doesn't cost $2,000, but cost within the $100 realm. For years, I was obsessed with air shocks or air bladders. These are hollow polyurethane air bladders. Each one of these slides depicts many months, much time spent, and prototypes made on each and every one of these over the last 11 years. They all have to do with compressing some member and gaining some sort of vertical shock, actually minimizing the expense by having simple components. So the future looks like, looks like this. That's the foot I'm wearing on the stage today. It's a continuous piece of carbon graphite bent in the shape of the cheetah's leg. It's attached here in the middle of the foot. No matter where I load the heel of the toe, I always am guaranteed at least one inch of vertical travel with a substantial amount of force. This is uh, a version that allows us to make this continuous C automated. And this is my favorite. This is what we call the diving board. Basically, when you land, it's this spring that's doing all the work. And when I bounce on my toe and there's leverage involved, the secondary spring kicks in at a gradual pace because this diving board folds up and engages the second spring. It's got like two gears built into this one very lightweight foot. This is a rendition of that, but these are air bladders. And this is the next version of the Cheetah 2. This is what I would hope Oscar Pistorius would wear. This is a more dynamic response, dual spring, leaf spring with an adjustable once again, air bladder design to attenuate what stiffness you want on that particular run. These are the air bladders. Once again, using a CAD design here so you can see all the shapes and how they're joined together and how they would be positioned in between the two graphite springs. You'll get a sense of what vertical shock and compression of graphite is all about. Look at how much those two springs are moving. Here's the foot that I'm wearing right now, a single spring. Watch the compression at the end of the stroke. Small battery small amounts of energy, large battery, large amounts. This is my sprinting foot. This is what Oscar feels when he's running on that toe. Look at compress. There's about 600 pounds compressing that because I'm bouncing it with about three G's worth. How do I have something that's so stiff and yet so strong and yet so compliant? It's because I'm utilizing that entire length. There's no bumper in joint system. It allows complete freedom of motion all the way through. That's a filament winding machine. That machine can wind thousands of feet a day. It's a means to, for us to take the cost from $2,000, hopefully in less than $100. The second half of the equation 
If someone came to me and said, you can have a great foot or you can have a comfortable socket, I'll take the comfortable socket. Because pain, well, how many of you have had a pebble in your shoe? It's the most irritating and painful and annoying thing you can do, especially if you have to work on it all day long. So what we've come up with is imagine 100 small little water beds lining the inside of the socket. And imagine you can adjust each one of those water beds. How comfortable could that be? You go down to Mexico, you catch a bug, you lose five pounds. You look in the mirror, it's after Christmas, you've put on 10. Those are the kind of situations that make hell for an amputee. The stump is not some static organism. It's dynamic. It changes like the rest of their body. The socket needs to accommodate. This is a later design taking the adjustable nature of a flat little disc that can expand inside the socket and pushing against silly putty. Silly putty captured by polyurethane in a mold so that when you squeeze on that little pad that's about two inches oblong, it shapes and it takes the form of the muscle or the bone that is conforming around. Remember, this is all something that we designed so that it can actually be built as a kit in Africa, in Cambodia, South America. Any prosthetist that has any skill at all can fashion this kit. There's the stump, there's a mold, there's the silly putty with the surround polyurethane, and various sizes that will come in the kit. And you just adapt certain sizes and builds up around the mold until it's completely completed. And then inside the socket it goes, and this is the oil dome that gets positioned. Each one, each oil dome, gets its own silly putty. So I can attenuate every square inch of that entire socket. And this is a product that I have been working on for almost 25 years. And I am so, so glad that those 25 years are behind me. I can't tell you the number of prototypes and models that I've built, completely different than what's shown here. But this, all of it led me up with persistence had, le had led me to this point. Here's a prosthetic swim fin attached to the socket to minimize leverage. Here's a ski leg that goes right into ski bindings. Here's my surf leg. You notice it's C-shaped in case I jump off the board and I hit sand and hollow so that I can actually paddle the board out and not feel like a rudder going out into the water. And that, I think, is it. So I really thank you. <laughs>